and invite Oliver and I don't think Kyle is here. So Oliver to present data working groups and work elements. Um, and one more operation, if you feel our topic wasn't discussed, um, leave it in the comments and we will try to post it in a community format that it can be later resolved. Uh, we are just trying to keep the time. Thank you. Oliver. Yeah. <coughs> Kyle is, by the way, here. Ah, wow. Okay. Uh, but I'm going to do the presentation. It's fine. Um, I'm going to share my screen really quick. Okay. Yeah, so this is the, I'm going to talk about the did off working group um, really quick because uh, I think we'll use a lot of the time to show you some demos later on. Um, yeah, I'm one of the co-chairs, Oliver from Consensus and Kyle, who is also on the call um, from Meta is the, the other co-chair of the DIT authentication working group. So our mission is to design, recommend, implement authentication and authorization protocols that rely on open standards and uh, cryptographic protocols using DITs and DIT documents. So this is really just copy and paste it out from the official DIT of working group charter. And in the last couple of months, we focused on basically two work items um, primarily, and that's the first one is the um, dead PSYOP specification. Um, so it's not an approved spec yet, so it's still subject to change. What is um, PSYOP in general? PSYOP stands for Self-Issued OpenID Connect Provider. It is actually an OpenID Connect flow, also defined in the OpenID Connect core specification. It's um, not heavily used, but it get got more and more traction, especially we will have a joint meeting with so DIF members and OpenID Foundation members in June 25, I guess, um, where we'll talk about um, reference implementations and also how to move forward with this work item. And in contrast to traditional OpenID Connect authorization code flows, for example, um, the SIOP flow is, does not require a centralized um, uh, identity provider, or my connect provider, or you know, <laughs> or of two provider, and so it's very similar actually um, with what we do in the SSI community. It also has um, very similarities to SSI wallets, for example. <clears throat> the goal is that we would use DIDs uh, and a SIOP implementation, which could be an SSI wallet, for example. Um, together to achieve login and sign up to a uh, service provider, web page, relying party, you name it. And one of the goals was specifically to stay backward compatible, com compatible with existing um, OpenID Connect clients, um, which again is um, where, where SIOP is actually part of the core spec. But um, then we also specified it rules for um, plain OpenID Connect clients um, to enable them to use um, DAD-based authentication. You can find more information um, here in the GitHub repository. So that's the uh, specification currently working on, also some flow diagrams, um, etc. And yeah, so this is um, for those people who are familiar with the W3C verifiable credentials uh, specification and their actors, um, if you compared um, PSYOP um, with the W3C verifiable credentials ecosystem, then the PSYOP um, would map onto the holder agent SSI wallet and the, the relying party um, onto the, the, the verifier component. And the verifier is in that case, um, for example, a web application. To give you a better overview or better understanding of how this can be used in practice, we will show two demos, one from Validated ID and the other one from Radical Ledger. I hope both people are on this call. Um, Albert, are you, are you on the call? Yep, I'm, I'm here. Great. So, um, are you ready to present your demo? <laughs> then you can uh, basically... Yeah. Uh, so... Stop, stop sharing. <clears throat> Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, you can see your screen. Okay, okay. so just a, a quick demo. Uh, and first of all, just I wanted to picture about the, like the demo architecture. The, uh, the demo basically what is showing is, is the, 
the, the CIOP flow, which uh, a user uh, that can either we have a, like a web wallet, let's say, or an ape wallet that is going to connect to its backend uh, or cloud agent, let's say. And this user is going, going to go to the, a website, a Reliant Party website, and it just want to, to do a, a sign-in. And this sign-in is going to start the, the whole job flow. And this Reliant Party also has a, a website a, and a backend server. And both servers has this CIOP library implementation. So then they can uh, create the request response token and also do the verification process. So in, in the first, so it's the same implementation, but in, in two different, uh, let's say examples. One of, is the, so the user is, is using a, a static website. So uh, because it's what's more easy in order to implement. So then when it goes to the, that website, it just passes the, the URL where is located the backend server or the cloud agent. So then all the operations goes into the backend. So in terms of the front end, you don't see anything it's just uh, going uh, on the backside. So if we go to the, this is, I mean, just uh, basic <laughs> website. It's right now we are on the web wallet. And here's a, a button that goes to the Real, Real Party ACME site. And if you, I don't know if you can see, but here is passing the URL on the backend server for the CIOP client. And then it just performs a signing. Oops, okay, this is the, okay, right now, the demo effect. So right now here, what happens is uh, all the, the flow has been perform on the, on the backend. And now let's say here it's already signed in and using the DT. So, okay, we have in, interchanged the DADs and, and this is the DAD from the, from the, the CIO client. And this is like the, the first demo. And the second version of the, the same one is a user uh, browses into the, uh, the computer into uh, the, the same static website website from the Reliant Party, and then uh, this user has a web wallet, and so the static, uh, so the Reliant Party is showing a QR code, and then the the flow starts when the user scans it, that QR code, and then it, again it's performing on the on the backend at least the the second part. So okay, let me. So here. We are again on the real and party uh, site, and here, right now, I don't, I don't have the or the, the real party doesn't know how to connect to me, so it's, it's showing me a, a QR, which I'm scanning, and right now it's performing the, the that CIOP, uh flow and showing the the key from the CIOP client, and this is like the the second part, so performing the request, the response, and the verification. So more or less, that's, that's the end. This implementation, I just wanted to, uh, to, to also explain that um, we are going to adapt this, this implementation with some feedback we received and also incorporate the encryption part that uh, is written on the specs, but hasn't been implemented. So uh, when we got there, then we, we can publish that. and. Just also mentioning that besides this implementation that it's in the div uh, repo, uh, we are using that kind of a flavored version, but using the same specs on the ESIF EPC project, which is stands for the European Social Sovereign Identity Framework on the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure. And I mean, it's quite, quite a, a important relevant project in the, into the uh, the European space, which will be published in a couple of weeks, uh, the the source code, so will be also publicly available. And also here, in, uh, well, in, in validated, we are also using that deep CIOP specs on, on our SSI solution. Cool, thank you very much. Um, I think, um, Juan, you are running this call. Um, do we have time now for questions? So we should should we um, have questions later. Okay. Um, 
I think it works best if all the presentations present and then everyone has questions for all the presenters. Um, so all right. um, we should probably go to secure data storage next, if that's okay with everyone. And feel oh, free no, to no, use yeah, the yeah, Slido. Yeah. <laughs> we are not ready yet. Um, so I was just um, asking whether someone oh. has questions specifically on um, the presentation oh. from, from Validated LB. Um, this would, next up would be the presentation from Radical Ledger. Oh, Jim, are you on the call? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Uh, cool. Yeah, let me start the sharing. Uh, could you guys see my screen? Uh, Not yet. Not yet. Yep. All right. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a kind of the similar implementation as uh, Albert was uh, presenting. Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to thank uh, Balash and Oliver and the DIFF uh, for allowing me to present this. Uh, I'm not really a member of the DIFF, but uh, they have been working with me uh, to get these things uh, going. Uh, yeah, I mean, our objectives was we're looking from the from the user's point of view, like, you know, we want to make sure that users can kind of uh, get on board with uh, self-issued identities uh, to access services. So, uh, so we want to make sure that uh, enable the end user so they could start using these services and, and provide the convenience for the end user and the, and the service providers and the, and the developers at the same time. So, so everyone could come together. Uh, so looking from this angle, the solution we want to build uh, uh, we want to address how easily end users could go to get on board and at the same time how the developers could get on board. Uh, to enable uh, developers, we have developer browser extension, uh, which basically work across all major browsers. Uh, and uh, next step would be to build a mobile application, but it's probably definitely the future work. Yeah, we are planning on that. Uh, to enable developers and uh, relying parties, uh, the, uh, platforms, uh, we have developed a JavaScript module and published on uh, NPM. So this basically works on both Node and uh, on browser, uh, on, on both these uh, platforms. So this enables everything, uh, uh, make everything easy for, for the user. Uh, I could show a quick demo. Uh, yeah, hope you can still see the screen. Uh, so this would be a typical relying party uh, application where you could log in with the with, the, with, the, with your DID uh, using a, a, a SIOP uh, service. Uh, here you could have like you know other logins as well uh, along with the DID login. Uh, so for this to work, uh, what you need is at the end user you you would need a, a, the extension in, uh, installed. Um, so basically, this is password protected, so the uh, keys are encrypted with the uh, with the password. Uh, so you can see the DID and at the same time we provide these guides uh, to like, you know, create a DID if someone wants and how the keys works and like, you know, how to how to configure the uh, extension uh, uh, to work with the rest of the things. Uh, setting is basically the core. Uh, you can see the DID and the, and the and necessary keys and the algorithms that have been used. Uh, the password can be changed. Um, yeah, so so that's pretty much uh, what you have, what you should need in the uh, in the extension. I mean, we have provided a set of test keys uh, as well. So if anyone just want to try it out, uh, of course that that, that is possible. Um, once you have the extension set up, uh, it's a matter of like you know, I mean, you, you go for go and click on the uh, login. Uh, so it asks for the consent from the relying party. Uh, I mean, ask the consent from the user. Uh, upon the approval, it basically, uh, yeah, it navigates to the the secure area of the application, meaning you have you have basically authenticated and, and authorized to access the uh, secure area of the application. Uh, so here, I mean, I mean, this process uh, comply with the uh, OpenID Connect uh, protocol. Uh, it, it specifically implements uh, implicit uh, flow. Uh, so basically, it generates a, a ID token, which is again wrapped as a, uh, a JWT token. So whatever the content that uh, redirected to the secure area can be is a JWT token, and you can simply see the uh, 
content of that uh, in any 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 JWT uh, browser or a, or a viewer. Uh, yeah, so that's how the user experience is. Uh, yeah, if you go back to uh, the presentation, I mean, uh, it's it's really simple to implement even at the uh, developer's end. Uh, so generate the request. Uh, all you need is, I mean, if you are integrating with the button, uh, you need a specific custom uh, attribute uh, with the name DID, uh, data DID SIOP. Um, I'll, I'll show you how the value get populated in a minute. Uh, and then we need the uh, browser compatible version of the NPM library uh, from a CDN. Uh, it's available for anyone to grab here. Uh, so then you need to get the instance of the RP, which provide uh, RP, the relying party helper uh, in, uh, class, instance of that and set uh, uh, where it should be redirected and uh, uh, the, the DID of the RP. Uh, then you need to add the signing parameters. Uh, I mean, for demonstration purposes uh, and, 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 and testing, we have included the private key uh, hard-coded here. Uh, but the idea is all this information will be uh, generated in the back end and will be sent as a uh, as a duty uh, some sort of a, uh, JSON uh, token to the client side. Uh, once these things are there, it's a matter of generating the request and encode it as a URL. And that would be the value for the custom attribute that we mentioned. So upon the click, uh, basically, it, it is picked up by the... Um, Browse extension, and uh, and basically it, it validates all the data, uh, the the ID of the RP and the uh, and and it again gets signed by the user's uh, uh, private key and pass into the client. So uh, to the restricted area, basically, if everything works well. So to resolve again on the on the on the uh, uh, relying party redirect. URL or the home, home home screen of the application. Again, you need the same uh, library, and you would go through the exact same steps as earlier, uh, getting the instance of the RP and adding the signing parameters, and then you could validate the response so that that gives you the guarantee that uh, uh, consent has been given and the keys provided are uh, valid uh, by the user uh, as per the DID document. So yeah, this is basically the integration aspect of it, and. Uh, uh, yeah, this is what we have delivered. So we believe this is kind of ready to go out. We are relying on Ethereum for the DIDs, but it should work with other aspects as well. Uh, so all this information can be found on DIDSIOP, uh, OG, uh, and uh, all the all the developments are open source. Basically, you 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 could have access to uh, all the materials there. Yeah, that's pretty much. Awesome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> awesome demo, and. We have yeah. one minute left, then I think Kyle also wants to talk about the potential next work item that we want to tackle in the group. Kyle, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Uh, all right, yeah, everybody should be able to see. If you got one minute, I'll just run through this very quickly. Um, so essentially, uh, with the did up stuff uh, we've been working on um, trying to get this finished we've got multiple implementations now for a bit um, and so that, uh, that leaves the did off working group open to uh, new work item proposals um, and so essentially what we're uh, thinking about working on here is uh, aligning the uh, jose kids with uh, um, did ids um, so essentially uh, why is this needed? Um, what it really comes down to is there's a gap where um, kids and Jose and the ID field in the public key property of a did document can cause interoperability and um, identifier concerns. Uh, and that exists because of the, the language gaps um, between the different specifications. Um, so, I mean, more specifically where this goes is uh, essentially uh, you can have issues where keys uh, that are used to identify things um, don't necessarily uh, confer state. So if I only have um, key one here, uh, you know, it, it doesn't confer if I'm talking about the did document state of version one or version two, uh, which ends up causing problems uh, for your cryptographic operations um, as well as uh, different identifiers. Um, additionally, there's there's no standard uh, convention. So for example, I believe ION has um, uh, so some specifics around how uh, 
key fragments should be identified, uh, whereas uh, Sovereign makes no mention of it. I'm pretty sure uh, many other did methods don't make mention of, of how to identify fragments either. Um, so that can causes uh, interoperability concerns. And then finally, um, in terms of the, the cryptographic uh, capabilities of it, um, when you're dealing in public keys, you don't necessarily have a way to be able to link it to an identity. And that's where ultimately it comes down to the authenticity of an identity um, to be identified. So uh, essentially where this is going is we'd like to uh, put forth a, a work item for this uh, working group. Um, I will probably be leading the charge on this uh, and I'm looking for others to collaborate on it. Um, we found with did PSYOP uh, in the past that uh, Oliver who led the charge on that had to do a lot of the work on that. So uh, one of the things we're looking to do in this working group is to find um, two people to champion a work item. Um, I'll be one of them, but I'm uh, soliciting others uh, to be able to get assistance and get this done. So that'd be appreciated. Um, as far as possible solutions, uh, it's not really decided yet. It's kind of more of a uh, approach-based idea. Um, we could go the route of just basically building on RFCs and then identify how to do it for non-JWKs. Um, rely on version query parameters from the did core specification. So that's kind of like uh, being able to do things like this um, where you're specifying version. Um, and then finally, we can uh, choose our own adventure. Um, but let's try to stay within the uh, did core spec if we're going to go that route. So, uh, again, don't really have any biases in terms of direction. Um, either, these are just the methods I've heard. If you've got other ones, that's great. Uh, as far as next steps, uh, let's come together, find a solution, um, and then uh, start working on that within the did auth working group uh, is what we're thinking. Uh, I believe you will need to sign up for IPR. Um, uh, uh, contributor feedback agreement in order to do so. Um, and then uh, we'll find a fitting home. So this is just an incubation process uh, to be done in DIDOF uh, working group. It could be moved to um, IETF, W3C. Um, we don't really have considerations into that. So as a part of the process of, of uh, defining this, we'll, we'll decide where we want to take it next. Um, and ultimately what this is about is filling gaps on Jose usage, uh, outside of the did core spec. So trying to align these things um, and lead to us being able to build upon it as an open standard. So with that, I'll stop sharing. Wow, racing against the clock. Uh, a quick quick um, clarification question. Did, uh, were, did you say you were looking for two people uh, or were you looking for one person to be the... Uh, uh, looking for one additional person at this point. Um, okay. it just it, It's a formality that Oliver and I have decided to do within the working group, and I'd suggest other working groups take it into consideration. If you're doing multiple work items, um, it's uh, much easier on the chairs if you've got people uh, leading the, the work item effort, similar to how CCG uh, handles their work items. Awesome. Great. Uh, and yeah, I think I think that uh, recommendation is already circulating. I can't speak for uh, how far or where, but I have heard of it <laughs> being floated. Uh, so awesome. Um, and the chat is full of links to slideshows and links to these demos. Um, but I think we, in the interest of time, we should probably get to SDS and hold all the questions till the end. Is, um, I'm assuming Tobias is in here. Kalia, Dimitri, who's here? Oh, Tobias is here. Dimitri is uh, leading, I think. Yeah, and I'm here to fill in for Dimitri if needed. Is he there? Are we waiting for Dimitri? That's a full Nathan. I'm no. seeing both the. Dimitri and Tobias are, or a Tobias is here, maybe not the looker. I think, I don't think Dimitri is going to be able to attend. He asked me to um, ah. speak for him, um, but I'll let okay. the chairs start off. 
Sure. Um, so um, I'm one of the co-chairs along with Dimitri and Tobias. And this is, um, as been mentioned before, is a collaborative um, working group that's both under the CCG at the W3C and the Decentralized Identity Foundation. Um, and we're focused on um, getting a specification for um, secure data storage, which is encrypted data storage for both individuals, but also um, entities. Uh, so I will let, uh, hand it over to Ori to give a description of the work. Awesome. Um, so some background for the group. Um, there was a concept which uh, Daniel Buckner had um, been working on a, a while ago. I think he would he would say he started working on it like back when he was working at Mozilla, and it was about you know how can I secure my personal data, how can I control access to uh, and grant access to personal data, um, and that work evolved under the branding of identity hubs and personal data stores. Um, and there was some specifications at DIFF. And at one point there was a uh, DIFF uh, sort of implementation around that. Um, and then in parallel, there was uh, within the rebooting web of trust and W3C CCG communities, there was uh, work on aligning IPFS and solid and Tahoe LFS and a number of other technologies for encrypting data and um, granting access to encrypted data. And that work became branded as Encrypted Data Vaults and was uh, funded in part um, by the Department of Homeland Security um, Silicon Valley Innovation Program as a potential solution to storing sensitive trade documents and other uh, trade-related material associated with decentralized identifiers. Um, and so, as Kalia mentioned, um, one of the biggest wins that um, the community has had uh, in re recent times is the W3C, CCG, and DIFF coming together under the Secure Data Store Working Group to develop a joint specification that covers both the encrypted data vaults concepts and the identity hubs concepts. Um, and so if you heard confusion over in the naming, it's because we're still working out that part. Uh, but the good news is that there's a lively discussion and we're sorting out uh, the layers of each of these technologies and how they build on top of each other and how they relate to other standards. Um, and uh, it's a very active uh, community um, and ongoing work. And uh, I think that's probably enough of a summary. <laughs> Um, Kalia, would you like to give a little bit of a status update on how uh, how far the the group is and in, in towards that spec? Um, well, we've um, made a lot of progress. Um, well, in the in the when any group starts orientating and understanding. Um, Developing shared language and shared understanding through through the group has been is a focus, and we have a stack. Actually, I don't have the stack up. Do you have the diag the stack, um, Ori? I do not have access to that, but I can. Um... Oh, I found it. I've got it. I will share it. Um, so there is a preliminary. Um, there is a this diagram of sort of dividing the universe um that we're focused on into some layers um there's broad agreement about these um these different layers and we're um proceeding to sort of the next step for the group is to dive into layer a and to agree on what lives there Yep, it's perfect. Kalia, without prescribing my view, may I talk about 
amazing things I think people should be able to do with this thing that we could possibly have in the future? Could I talk just uh, with like use cases? Amazing fun sure. use cases. Go okay. go ahead. So my hope is that at the end of all this, we'll have a data store. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with web APIs, but um, there's like a web API called IndexedDB. It allows you to do storage basically on the client uh, for websites. And you can store lots of data, hundreds of megabytes, whatever you want. Um, it was great for developers, right? Before that, we only had local storage, which was like five megabytes in some browsers, and it was you know, not very, not very good. Um, but we got IndexedDB, and that, that made a lot of app situations possible, right? Um, but it, it still isn't a data store that carries with you, right? Like it's something just for that site and that domain and you know, other domains can't use it. So if I was running Spotify on my uh, app, you know, on my phone and it stored some data as the web app, <clears throat> it wouldn't synchronize to you know, even the other, other Spotify app on my desktop uh, machine, for instance, let alone if I used say Spotify on my phone and then maybe Groove on my desktop laptop. Um, and, and that's, that's sad because, you know, people might have playlists that they create for music and they don't really want to go recreate that playlist or drag files around between devices. That's, that's a pain in the ass, right? So, um, I hope what we get in the end is the ability to have a personal data store, um, you know, data store based on this, that when I grant an application like Spotify access to this personal data store, maybe they can start storing my, um, music playlist files in a common place. And I might even give a different application on a different device uh, that I like for music in that ecosystem um, access to that same data. And you can imagine if applications were able to store via an, an, you know, an API that they didn't have to know where the storage was or who the provider the person picked, it was all standardized, um, and could work off the same data, right? Song apps all working off the same corpus. You never have to go, you're basically working on one set of data that belongs to you. Um, and you can allow people in to see it or use it or, you know, visualize it for you in whatever ways you want. And that can be whether it's, you know, song apps or it's, you know, your personal pictures or tweets you want to share with the world. Um, if everyone kind of reimagined apps around, you know, visualization of data that was lived with people, I think that's, that might be one high level end goal of our work in SDS. Thanks, Dan. Are there any questions for us? Hi, Kalia. See you in the uh, Ian. Ian. Sorry, just um, for if we are at the questions, sorry, and to jump in, um, we should like squeeze in the glossary group a short presentation on the glossary project and then do all the questions in one go. Yeah, okay. Sorry, Ian. No problem. Okay. Uh, I, is Margo here? <laughs> I. Okay, I'll do my. Um, Thank you, yeah, no problem. Um, so I'm going to pull up the slides that we did for the Glossary group. Um, we've shared these a few places, but it's worth sharing again because there is 78 people here and we did some really awesome work. Um, so. Um, the glossary group was commissioned by folks who were at IAW 29 um, just over six months ago. And there was a lot of confusion about different terms being used and what did they actually mean. And we, um, we wanted to, to you know, address this need. And we decided very strategically to focus on not the technical words being used in specification across a range of the working groups because they know what they're talking about in that context because they're often defining those words before and as they get started doing their work. Um, and not necessarily addressing things at the level of um, everyday English, but trying to address the needs that folks are having in terms of marketing and communication about what different things were um, to a, we called them the informed layperson was sort of the level of vocabulary we were aiming to get at. Um, and we surveyed the community to see which um, terms they thought we should 
um, work on defining first. Uh, top was SSI, then wallet agent and credentials, and we decided to demur on uh, SSI. It's just too much. <laughs> So we started out by actually asking everybody to um, ev everybody who got our survey and we distributed it throughout the community to define these terms and also define the relationship between the terms. Um, and we got back a whole bunch of answers. And what we did was we sort of took them apart and we basically um, did a virtual post-it note exercise where we clustered the definitions to understand the underlying meanings that were within them. And we came up with a bell curve of meaning. As you could, these are the results. So for credential, 14 people as part of their de definition, we're talking about structure and standards of those credentials, another um, significant group was talking about identity data. Um, so, of course, so we, anyways, that became part of the center of the definition. While it also had a bell curve of meaning around key and secret storage and credential storage. Um, and so the, and, and there was a much wider range of definitional meaning for agent, but a more significant concentration around representation of the subject. So these are the definitions that we came up with. Credentials provide a standards, uh, structured standards for accessing identity data. Wallets provide storage of keys, credentials, and secrets often facilitated or controlled by an agent. And an agent, um, we sort of went back to the de dictionary definition, which is a person or thing that takes an active role and produces a specified effect. And when we looked at what um, came out of our community's work, we came up with this longer definition. An agent is a software representation of a subject, most often a person that controls access to a wallet and other storage can live in different locations on a network, cloud versus local, and can facilitate or perform messaging or interactions with other subjects. So um, we, um, and then we looked at the definition of the edges of this sort of triangle. Um, so while, so you, I'm just gonna let these speak for themselves um, in the presentation. And we're hoping that, um, we're hoping that these, actually this needs to change. This is one to three Pacific, one to two Pacific time right now. Um, we're hoping that these, this process and these terms can support convergence towards common meaning. We can't tell anybody what to say in their marketing copy, but we're hoping that this um, can support convergence of meaning across the community and we're exploring what to do next with this group. Um, we'd love to define um, some more terms if that would be helpful and which terms we should work on defining and how is sort of up for um, consideration in the community's next meetings. So I'll stop there. Great. Um, so I think that's all of the working groups. Uh, apology again uh, to Jim and Redica Ledger. Um, and I think we should probably go to Q&A. Um, there are, to, uh, so far, um, I'll post the Slido link again. And um, so why don't we start with SDS questions. Someone asked, is there a Demo implement or implementation of SDS currently, uh, and uh, in the context of SSI, will SDS be used as VC storage? Um, maybe Ori or Daniel could answer that one. Yeah, I can take a stab at that. So um, there is so, like I mentioned, there's there's two specifications which are in the process of being unified. One of them, Encrypted Data Vaults, uh, has uh, 
two, at least two server implementations, um, which are currently not open source, but the client side of them is open source. So the client SDK is open source and the HTTP API that uh, is used to talk with them is open source. And there's, there's been some interop tests and demos around that functionality. Um, and it's a work item for the Secure Data Store Working Group to develop a reference implementation that's open source and public that can support all of that. Uh, for Identity Hubs, there was an implementation of them hosted in Diff. Uh, it's no longer maintained, and we're um, waiting to formalize that API that uh, Daniel mentioned um, to take another pass on getting that uh, re reference implementation to support that higher level API. Great. Um, and um, the, to the second point about VC storage. Oh, yeah. Um, totally a good place to put verifiable credentials in a world where you want to be able to move them from one storage provider to another without the storage provider knowing whether you have, you know, COVID or not. I'm trolling, uh, but seriously, uh, a, a big part of the motivation behind the technology was as a place for credential storage, especially on the encrypted data vault side. Um, however, on the identity hub side, and, and I, I personally am really excited about this, um, storage for data that's related to a did subject that isn't a credential is a primary use case for identity hubs. And as Daniel mentioned, um, we're really excited to get that API up and running. And um, so it's not, I, I want to just be super clear. Uh, the idea is, is for these things not to just store credentials. Great, great. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go through some more Slido questions here. Um, there is a question for the PSYOP group. Um, I, someone asked, I think it was mentioned that you can do this without a relying party. Is this covered in the documentation, and if so, where? Hey, I wrote that, and I realized now that it was dumb. I meant IDP. Meaning, yeah, exactly. can, can, can you do this without a third-party IDP if it's just a single website, and what does that look like? Yeah, so exactly. This is actually what PSYOP is about. So in contrast to traditional, to the more popular OpenID Connect flows, which are um, the authorization code flow, for example, um, you don't require a an IDP in that loop, basically. So the PSYOP is the SSI wallet, for example, an app or like an, a browser extension that we um, that was demonstrated in the presentation from uh, Radical, Radical Ledger, for example. So that PSYOP is actually the OpenID Connect provider in a traditional sense. Um, but because you are in control of that OpenID Connect provider, you are the OpenID Connect provider, which is the PSYOP. Um, so there is no centralized IDP involved, and PSYOP is a, uh, a flow defined in the um, OpenID Connect core specification, um, but um, it's not heavily used um, by relying parties yet. Does this answer your question? Yeah, sort of. I, it feels really complicated in a case where you don't actually have a separate IDP. And so uh, one of my open questions that I do not have the answer for is what would a simpler alternative be like? And is it still worth using SIOP even if you could come up with something much simpler? But I don't have an answer to that. I, I was just sort of curious. To, so this helps. Thanks for the answer. Yeah, I mean, it solves also the, the OpenID Connect provider discovery um, problem or NASCAR problem. Mm. Um, uh, it does if I care about OpenID. My question is, is if I don't otherwise care about <laughs> OpenID, should I use it? The question is um, whether there are other standardized methods for um, DID-based authentication yet. Um, probably there are some proprietary ones. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a good question, basically. I, I think I, I've concluded that there aren't any. And I think to answer my question, I'm going to have to at least rough draft one to see what it looks like and to see whether it's worth it or not. Um, in the case that you don't care about OpenID, it might still make sense. And that's one of the answers I don't have. Yeah. Uh, a possibly redundant, possibly rephrasing or possibly totally separate question, I don't really know. Uh, someone asked, is did PSYOP solving 
the same problem as DDoS logins, or are there any major differences? Um, DDoS logins are logins such as you log in with your uport app or with your ulocom app and so on, or are that off logins? I I don't know. I didn't ask the question. I guess so. The the, the, the short, uh, short answer is yes. It's just it's just one flavor of yeah. it's it's one flavor of um, DID authentication, um, which specifically has the goal to be backward compatible with um, existing SIOP implementations. But again, there are not so many. Right, okay. Uh, and then another possibly redundant question. Uh, how would you describe the relationship between SIOP, DDoS, and SDS access control protocols? Oh, oh, never mind. I just understood that. Okay, o oof. Um, I, that might, Able early in SDS to answer that, but maybe the SDS people could take a stab at it. So, what the relationship is between SIOP, um, DDoF, and or DDoF. SDS? And SDS? Si SIOP slash DDoF. Like, could SIOP uh, or some other DDoF be used as S access control for SDS? Yeah, oh, okay. potentially. Um, SIOP is a form of, of DDoF in a way. So I'm not so so. Once you have a way of authenticating a decentralized identifier, you can use the fact that that identifier has been authenticated as a, a means of access control. Um, so uh, basically, handing out ciphertexts that are secured for a specific decentralized identifier, you could rely on PSYOP to authenticate the uh, party that's requesting data and then hand them back data that is uh, assigned to them that's encrypted for them. So they, they could be combined in that way. But uh, correct, me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, SDS uh, does not require bids. It, it is also backwards compatible, right? There are, um, you could be using SDS with uh, traditional authentication right. or traditional authorization. Yeah, yeah. The authorization layer uh, for SDS is currently um, one of those layers we haven't gotten to yet. But things that fit in that authorization layer are things like HTTP signatures with DIDs, transactional OAuth, uh, OIDC SIOP, uh, regular vanilla OAuth, um, all different kinds of authorization schemes. So a thing that was not part of the question, but probably should have been if he was aware of that, which is funny because the nature of the question is that um, DIDCOM also ends up having authentication as a side effect. It uses authenticated encryption. So if I receive a message from another party, I can determine that it was in fact that person who sent it, which is kind of like authorization um, in similar how there's like so many other ways of authorizing these, these things as well. Right, like peer to peer authorization. Sure, and if one peer is a service provider, then it sort of feels like the others, right? So <laughs> there's lots of overlap there. Okay, got it. Awesome. Uh, and one uh, last question. Oh, wait, maybe it was... Oh, it got promoted. That's why. Um, someone asked about the relationship between PSYOP and FIDO2. Ooh, um, pretty good question. Um, I'm not creative enough to imagining a reasonable relationship between these two. I mean, I do believe that, um, for example, um, FIDO2 will have its place in the DID authentication landscape. So you would use um, FIDO2 token, sorry. You could use a FIDO2 token to um, increase the um, level of assurance level of your DID authentication type. Um, but I'm not sure how this can be done with SIOP at the moment. I mean, technically, you can always add any FIDO2 token in the authentication step. So technically, when the SIOP request hit your, hits your SSI wallet, you could um, connect a FIDO2 token, but um, that's, you know, it's out of scope of the specification. Like, um, authentication is always out of scope of the OpenID Connect specification. 
it, it, there's room for this, but um, it has not been done so far. <laughs> okay. Sounds unreasonable. Um, and uh, I think Dimitri, you had your hand up? Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, add on to what Oliver was saying about the FIDO2 question. So, two things. Uh, one, like Oliver said, it could be used as a local authentication mechanism when you're signing in to your wallet, right? Depending on whether it's a browser extension or a mobile app or a web page, you could conceivably hook it up to a FIDO2 and a web authentication hardware key uh, to log into that. And after that, it can serve as a PSYOP provider. So, so that's thing one. And thing two, although there isn't quite explicit support for it uh, at the moment, I do know that the, for example, the web authentication group for the uh, next version of the web authentication spec uh, is considering that as a use case, which is be able to uh, support digital signatures with the FIDO certified uh, hardware keys. And if we ever, if that support ever lands, uh, that could play a really interesting part in the file as well. So that's it. I mean, if, I mean to that point, I think um, if this this really lands, then I think um, FIDO two slash uh, web authentication using DADs could be treated as its own DAD authentication flavor. I mean, you could technically then just um, you know, um, maybe that's not safe to talk about these things in that call. <laughs> Because <laughs> it's um, not IPR protected, so I don't know. <laughs> it's a really great idea. Please open issues and discuss on GitHub. Um, so one, one last question before we take a little break, before the next session. Um, in the chat, Adrian Gropper asked about FIDO2 and did peer. I know there's not a ton of did peer uh, experts on the line, but if anyone has any thoughts on that? Uh, in quick defense of Daniel Hardman, he had a family emergency this week and I know he intended to be here. Sorry, what's the question? <laughs> Kyle, uh, do, uh, do you know if there's any um, planned or possible interaction between FIDO2 tokens and did peer? Um, I haven't spoken to Daniel explicitly about this. Um, but I know in the past uh, we explored the concepts of it. Uh, nothing's been drafted uh, specifically about how they work. Um, I see the two as pretty largely orthogonal. Um, FIDO2 is more about a protocol layer, um, it, whereas, and, it, and it uses keys, whereas the uh, did peer would be more about the grouping of the keys. Um, which can be used for you know many different aspects. So uh, I see the two fitting together. Um, I don't see them as competing interests in any way. But as to how they fit together is uh, still to be determined. Awesome. Okay. Um, and totally didn't mean to <laughs> malign anyone for not being here. I uh, just didn't didn't uh, remember <laughs> off the top of my head <laughs> that no, you were you're totally totally with the fear. You totally di didn't malign. I, I just, I, I feel bad because I know he would have wanted to speak up. That's, that's all. There was no uh, maligning happening. Okay. Okay. Of course. Of course. And, and um, yeah, that is another GitHub repo people can open issues on if they have peer dead questions. <laughs> um, and uh, Dimitri, I think your hand is still up. Was this to address this other point? No, that's just from previous. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> no problem. Okay, so I think we're gonna, oh, uh, Ian, sorry, I don't think I addressed your comment enough in text. Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I was just the, uh, picking up on what Kalia was saying and making the point that there's a ton of work on uh, personal data stores over in My Data Global, obviously, but there's no desire to uh, reinvent any wheels. So uh, how do Absolutely. we best foster uh, kind of two-way collaboration? When, I mean, my personal take is the My Data Global, there's a load of people working on various things, but they're mainly 
societal or user needs or economic type stuff with less technical. Uh, so we don't need to reinvent anything over here, over there, if we can point to things over here. Uh, right, and and definitely, um, I think in particular the the most useful place to bring up um, privacy or data control or portability issues would be on the various issues on the GitHub around use cases. Um, right. If if uh, anyone that's familiar with the operators work or other uh, portability work um, is willing to join the group, or they would obviously be warmly welcome. Uh, but you know, if, if the level of, if that's no, too high level be, of I think, commitment. I think, there'll be, I think there'll be several already in the group, awesome. to be honest. Awesome, yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think the thing to do would be to shoot Balash an email about the logistics and the IPR yeah. agreements. Um, but yeah, the, the group, uh, and what might also be useful that occurs then is the, if this group could do a presentation into some appropriate point of the my data. Or, right. Uh, and the um, obvious thing, essentially, there's a, a program called my data operators, which essentially are about 49 organizations that want to build a business around personal data. Uh, and they meet every, uh, <clears throat> every two weeks. So yeah. present to that group would be one option. Um, I think that like our group has just gotten clear enough about the shape of what we're doing. And I, I, this is on our list of things to do this week Ian, is to reach out and yep. figure out when we can <clears throat> schedule mutual briefings across our two communities. So let's do that. Yeah. Good. Right to you. Thanks very much. Awesome. Um, 